Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Anderson, Chair of the Peace Studies Department, and I'd like to welcome you to the second session of the 31st Annual Peace Studies Conference. Uh, at this second session, we have presentations by Noreen Hirschfeld on the dangers of religious nationalism, lessons from the U.S. from Bosnia. And Vilbert von Zahn, the people of Iran will go into exile, practical and theological dilemmas of Middle Eastern churches since the beginning of the Syrian war. Noreen holds the Nicholas and Bernice Reuter Scholarship in Science and Religion here at CSBSJU. She's earned her MS from Penn State and a PhD in Spirituality from the Graduate Theology Union at Berkeley. Noreen was a Fulbright Visiting Scholar in Sarajevo in 2008. She's the author of three books and many articles, ranging from the prospects of artificial intelligence to reconciliation between Muslims and Christians in Bosnia. Vilbert is campus minister and lecturer in religion at Hagazian University. Additionally, he teaches courses at the Near East School of Theology in Beirut. He's an ordained minister in the Protestant Church in the Netherlands. He has a master's in theology from Utrecht University and a PhD as well in religious studies. Several Dutch theological journals have published his work, including on the topic of Christian-Muslim relations. The way this session will work is that there'll be some note cards passed along, uh, passed around, and you will have the opportunity, uh, there'll also be some pencils, uh, to write down any questions you have as they arise. We'll collect these during the talk. You can feel free to submit multiple questions on the same note card. Uh, I will then pose those questions after both presentations are finished. We also have two microphones, one on each side there. And that's probably the preferred way, a little more natural, hear it in your own voice to ask the questions. But uh, as they're going around, if you have a question, please note it and, and uh, send it to the edge. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, begin with Noreen. And please help me in welcoming uh, Noreen and Vilbert. Thank you, Jeffrey. And thanks to all of you for being here today. And thanks to the technology for not working. <laughs> uh, I guess I need to aim it a little better. 23 years ago, in the first genocide on the European continent since World War II, over 8,000 Muslim men and boys were killed uh, towards the end of the Bosnian War. Now, just a little history. This was a long time ago, so for you to be reminded the Bosnian War was part of a series of wars that uh, culminated in the breakup of the former Yugoslavia. The uh, first uh, province of the former Yugoslavia to break away was Slovenia, way up in the upper corner. Uh, they got away with a nine-day war. Croatia went next, and uh, they found themselves battling Serbia. Bosnia soon followed. So you see this progression from the northern part down towards the south. Um, Bosnia was a harder case than the others. Slovenia had very few um, minority people from the other provinces, so very few Serbs and Croats there. Croatia was a little harder, but Bosnia was even harder because there was a big mix of populations, both Serb, Croat, and Bosniak, which was the Muslim Bosnian population. When the war started, 47% um, of the population was Bosniak, about 31% was Serb, 17% was Croat, about 8% of the population called themselves simply Yugoslav. After the war, Bosnia ended up broken into two entities, as you can see on the map here. The darker green entity is the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is primarily the Bosniak and Serb entity. The lighter green in two parts, the Republika Srpska, which is the Serbian entity at the end of the war. Uh, the numbers on this particular uh, picture show the numbers of casualties, primarily of Bosniaks in the war. 
and the Bosniaks were the primary casualties. Just a few statistics here. In three years of civil war, over 100,000 people were killed. 80% of them were among the Bosniaks. Uh, more than 50,000 women were raped. More than 2 million people were um, displaced from their homes. And many of those people became refugees across wider Europe and have remained there. Um, there were also social consequences. Uh, before the war started, intermarriage in Sarajevo was 34%. After the war, 4%. So that shows you something about the lingering divisions and hatred that remained between the groups after the war. Uh, reconstruction of Bosnia cost about $8 billion over the last 20-some uh, years. And so, you know, there was widespread destruction. I remember in 2004, oh, 2003 actually, um, driving through the countryside and driving um, through one area of Bosnia where I think we went for 30 miles without seeing an intact building. So that gives you some idea of the scale of what happened in these three years to these three pe uh, peoples. Okay, but many people have said, well, that can't happen here, right? These people in the Balkans, they have always hated each other, you know. So this was something that you could just expect out of the Balkans. But that isn't true. You know, as I already said, 34% of the marriages were mixed marriages. Many people celebrated both Christian feasts and Muslim feasts. And a peace march in April of 1992 in Sarajevo brought out 100,000 people. These were 100,000 people marching for peace. <coughs> War broke out four days later. Okay? And that's a picture of just, you know, one tiny piece of that peace march. So it, it's not true that it can't happen here. It could happen anywhere. And it's not true that the, Bosnian, that the people in Bosnia always hated each other. Um, they had been living together peaceably for 40 years under Tito. They, the young people were totally surprised by the war. They had not expected it. They said, like we say, but that can't happen here. And it happened. Now the question for us today, since we're talking about religion and violence, is what was the role that religion played in what happened here? I mean, there were many factors that led to the war, um, but religion was a major one. Uh, oh, so this is my thing. History may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. And uh, the picture on the left is Milosevic talking to a rally. Uh, this is in Kosovo, and uh, this was before war had broken out. Um, he said a few things at this rally that are rather interesting. Um, let me find exactly what he said. Uh, he, he noted then that Serbia was the bastion that defended European culture and religion and European society in general. And he said, there, we are fi facing many battles, not armed battles, but it might come to that. Okay, so he hints at violence. He doesn't come right out and say there will be violence. Okay, religion's role. I'm going to look at four aspects of this. Uh, at the role played by religious mythology, by religious symbols and rhetoric, by the overt support of the war by religious leaders, and the tying of a country to a particular religious faith. So we'll look at Bosnia first, and then we're going to take a look at the United States and see if there are some parallels here. Okay, so here's Bosnia. We'll start with religious mythology. The Serbs go back to what they consider a founding myth of Serbian culture, and it's the cult of the doomed medieval Serbian kingdom, which was defeated and lost in 1389 on the battlefield of Kosovo Polje. And it, this was a battle of the Serbs against the Ottoman Turks. 
And the battle was a nationally defining historical and spiritual event. Okay, with, within the myth of this battle, Prince Lazar is seen as a symbol of both the suffering Christ and the suffering Serbian people, and also as the last defense against, of Christianity against Islam. And Lazar is the patron saint of Serbia, as you can see in the icon that's up on the right. Uh, take a good look at that picture on the left. You'll notice Lazar is being suckered there by the maid of Kosovo. And in the mythology, the maid of Kosovo is a Mary Magdalene sort of figure. Um, and she's going to appear again later. The myth of Serbs as the last bastion against Islam, the last bastion of European Christianity, is not gone. Here we have a rather modern poster that I got from a website, a Serbian website off the web, that points out uh, that the Serbs still see themselves as the bastion against Islam, the Islamic State. And you can see in the back that, that picture that harks back to the medieval battle of Kosovo Polia. Oops. Uh -oh. oh, man. Come on, back. All right. Don't you love computers? I'm a computer scientist, too. You'd think I'd be better at this. OK, now, how some of this symbolism was used. Um, when we look at the war, we find that, uh, first of all, there was a fair amount of rhetoric. As I already mentioned, Milosevic held a rally on the battlefield at Kosovo Polje, um, marking the 600th anniversary of that event. And uh, you know, that was where he said, uh, we have more battles to fight, not armed battles, but it may come to that. And the crowd chanted slogans like, Kosovo is Serb, and we love you, Slobodan, because you hate Muslims. Hmm, OK. And although the mention of religion in his speech was brief, the subtext was obvious that Serbia was and remains the last bastion of Christian Europe. Um, and there were even posters sold at the rally. I really tried hard to find a picture of these, but I couldn't, that depicted um, Christ, Lazar, and Milosevic as kind of a new trinity. So you know, they're clearly harking back to the religious symbols. Um, during the war, there were a number of explicit references made to religion. Um, we find that the, uh, the primate of the Orthodox Church in an Easter sermon in 1993 said that those who followed the Serb leader Radovan Krajic or the general Ratko Mladic were following the difficult road of Christ. Um, Mladic stated that the problem of Bosnia would be over if the Muslims would just convert. And uh, Karadzic declared in 1994 that our faith is present in all our thinking and decisions. The voice of the church is obeyed as the voice of supreme authority. And again, at rallies that he and Mladic would hold, the crowd would chant, tonight, God is a Serb. Um, few of the Serbs were actually religiously observant. Um, that did not prevent them from wearing religious symbols. Now, the pictures that I have up here are of the, a militia leader named Jeliko Raznatovic, but he was better known as Arkan. And his wedding was steeped in religious symbolism. You can see Arkan on the bottom wearing a humongous cross uh, as part of his wedding attire. Uh, he's posed with his wife in the middle. And she was deliberately dressed as the maid of Kosovo to hark back to the religious mythology. Um, also a picture of priests blessing paramilitary troops. And uh, this was a common procedure. 
Arkan himself, although not a particularly religious man, said, we are fighting for our faith. Now the problem here is that there's a total mix-up between faith and ethnicity, between faith, a church, and a people. Okay, so we find that uh, they're not fighting for any of the tenets of orthodoxy. Um, the our faith in our kind of statement is coterminous with our people. And this is in some way not uh, odd for a church that is what we call autocephalous. So the Serbian Orthodox Church has its own head and it is its own separate church within the larger constellation of orthodoxy. And yet what we find then is that religion gets tied to the state and the state gets tied to the religion and these become a self-reinforcing sort of vicious identity circle. So that you find that even the uh, patriarch of Sarajevo saying, a priest is a teacher and a judge and has to pull a gun to defend his people. Ethnicity goes first and religion or the confession of the religion becomes secondary to that. Now, you may be saying, wow, but there was more side, well, than one side in this war. Why is she only talking about the Serbs? So I want to say just a little bit about the Muslims as well. What we find is that at the beginning of the war, there's very little religious symbolism used by the Muslims. There's very little religious rhetoric. Part of that is that the Muslims are fighting a defensive war against a Serbian offense. The Serbs had all the weapons. They had been stockpiling weapons, but also they, Serbia, had what was left of the Yugoslav army. So they had the weapons that had been available as part of the army. The Bosniaks were left scrambling. Later, we find that they get help, um, and they got help primarily from Saudi Arabia and some of the other countries on the Arabian Peninsula. And as that help comes in, they become more overtly Islamic. So you start to see, for example, troops that are frankly looking like they just walked out of Lawrence of Arabia and with green headbands with Quranic in inscriptions on them. You did not see these until towards the very end of the war. And I think what we see in that war is an idea that the theologian René Girard made popular when he said that we are mimetic people. In other words, we do what the other does. And in fact, the Croat president, Franjo Tuđman, was quite explicit about that. And he gets quoted as saying, what the Serbs do, we do. And so you find that although one side starts with a lot of religious trappings and the other side does not, they pick them up as they are blamed for having them and as time goes on. Now, how did religion manage with all of this? Did this strengthen the religions of the groups? Did it weaken them? Well, frankly, when religion gets tied to nationalism, religion suffers. The first way that we can see that religion really suffered in Bosnia was in the destruction of churches, mosques, minarets. Uh, and just to give you some idea of the size of this destruction, uh, in Bosnia, approximately 1,000 mosques, 340 Orthodox churches, 450 Catholic churches, and monasteries were destroyed. Of the mosques in Bosnia, 92% of the mosques were destroyed and 100% of the minarets in Serb-held territory were destroyed. However, after the war, churches and mosques were some of the first things to get rebuilt. The interesting thing, though, is that they get rebuilt 
in different and contentious ways. If I go back to the previous <coughs> picture, you can see the uh, kind of, first of all, the smallness of the churches and the mosques. You can see that in many ways, yeah, they're somewhat architecturally different, but they're not that different. And that they are not that different from the other types of buildings that you see in the land. However, when things get rebuilt, you see something different. Okay, many of the mosques, particularly in the larger cities like Sarajevo, were rebuilt with money from Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, or Egypt. And that money came with strings attached. Usually it came with architectural plans. So you see mosques now that look more like they would be at home in the desert than they do in the hills of Bosnia. And there was one more string attached to that. And at the end of that string, there was usually a cleric. And they said, we will rebuild your mosque. And guess what? We'll staff it for you, too. Aren't you lucky? Well, this is not lucky. Just as the architecture changes from small uh, mosques that fit within the landscape, that fit within the other architecture in Bosnia, so does the theology change from a very liberal-oriented, Western-oriented, and Sufi-oriented Islam to a more Wahhabi oriented Islam. The uh, Islam um, of the Sufi poets, uh, and how many of you have read Rumi, you know something about that, gets replaced by the, the, the strict legalistic Islam of the desert. And this does not necessarily go down well for the people. Other contentions are where things get built. Um, the other picture shows a Serbian church that got rebuilt on land owned by a Bosniak woman. So that's, uh, her name is uh, Fata Orlova. She's pointing at uh, this church that is on her land. Um, this church became a bone of contention after it was built. It remains a bone of contention. I was surprised to go back and find that just as recently as two years ago, there's still stuff online talking about um, her getting death threats and about um, there just being contention in the area. The church, by the way, now stands empty, and they're, they're saying they're going to relocate it, but they have not gotten around to doing that yet. Um, what else can we say about religion? Uh, just a, a few other things. Um, along with the, the stricter Wahhabi religion, uh, you now see a number of women wearing hijab in Sarajevo. Um, before the war, most young women in particular would have thought that a headscarf belonged on a babushka. You know, but now it's worn as a statement, not always of religious piety, but often just of identity. Um, Omar Spahic, the first Muslim to return to the town of Srebrenica after the genocide, said, when I asked him, um, has religion uh, you know, gotten stronger at all because of this war, told me, no, and the frenzy of religion construction is ironic. People turned to religion, but it was an illusion. Now the mosques and churches are empty. Religion is not important. The U.S. State Department has noted that the rate of religious participation is low and that although religion is now taught in the schools in Bosnia, and you could take your pick of which religion you want, although again there's contention around this because in certain areas of the country, although they're supposed to offer all the different religions, they don't. Okay. Um, and yet religious literacy also remains low. Hate crimes continue. General Jovan Divyak, an ethnic Serb who defied the sectarianism and actually led the defense of Sarajevo against the Serb forces, has said, and this was again only a few years ago, he said, 
The hate is worse now than it was just after the war. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. And just this fall, Milorad Dodik, who was the newly elected Serb member of a tripartite presidency, elected just uh, a few weeks ago, um, said of the US and Britain, they're forcing us again to live with those we couldn't live with in the big Yugoslavia. The only response is to strengthen the Serb national identity. So 23 years down the road, and the fear of the other still drives Bosnians to vote within their religious and ethnic enclaves for politicians who they know are deeply corrupt. And in the end, those voters suffer from their vote. Um, they suffer with problems in their communities of drug addiction, depression, loss of faith, and loss of meaning. And the loss of trust in religion as a spiritual anchor is, I think, one of the greatest tragedies of the religion-nationalism link. Politically motivated religious rhetoric demeans our religious vocabulary. Theologian William Schweiker, speaking of our own country, said, at stake is the reach, depth, and nuance of human existence. What is defaced is the universe of discourse for articulating the highest human aspirations. There are practical losses as well. When I spoke to the imam in Srebrenica, he said that he and the priest there had talked about coming up with joint programs to discuss um, and to try to target mental health issues, issues of addiction, issues of homelessness within Srebrenica but that the religious rhetoric and the nationalist rhetoric of the Serbian priest made working together simply impossible. So although the people would definitely benefit from such cooperation, when nationalism gets in the picture, it can't happen. So what about history's rhymes? And here I want to just quickly point out some of the things that I imagine all of you from your chuckles have already noticed. Okay, another interesting story is just outside of Srebrenica, there's a Serbian village, and it has a small monument to the Serbs who lost their lives in the war. And when uh, our group from St. John's was there, we struck up a conversation with a couple of guys who were sitting at the monument. And we said we were Americans, and one of them said, oh, America has had some very fine people. And we said, oh, who do you have in mind? And he said, Robert E. Lee. And as we talked a little more, you know, it became clear that the Serbs themselves draw a parallel between the lost cause of Kosovo Polia and the lost cause of the Civil War. And uh, an interesting thing that I read just a couple of days ago, um, it was an article talking about the um, rise in the flying of the Confederate flags in small towns in the north. And by the way, if you don't believe that this is happening, just drive by Rikori uh, sometime. You'll see pickup trucks parked with Confederate flags flying from them. Um, and so, you know, an interesting picture, a nice snowy Minnesota roadway, and there we have the Confederate flag. Um, this idea of a lost cause and this mythology behind it is being played up within our society now. And just as Milosevic played up the lost cause when he had that rally on Kosovo Polia, remember, he also hinted at violence to come. And I am terribly disturbed when I hear similar hints at Trump rallies. Um, for example, uh, Trump said, let's see if I can find this here, uh, at a recent rally that if you don't vote for Republicans in the midterms, Democrats will, quote, overturn everything we've done, and they'll do it quickly and violently. These are violent people. And he also said, this is a referendum not just on your politics, 
but on your religion. So politics and religion are being very much tied together, not with saying, go out and do violence, but with hints that there may be violence to come. And uh, I picked this particular picture because that, of course, is the representative from Montana who body slammed a Guardian reporter. And at a recent rally in Montana, Trump said, um, hey, you know, a guy who can do a body slam, that's my kind of guy. Again, not calling for violence, but there's a subtext underneath, the same as Milosevic had. Um, Trump, of course, gets a great deal of evangelical support. And there's an eerie similarity with some of the rhetoric that we are hearing, particularly from evangelical ministers. Um, Pat Robertson said that in a dream he saw Trump sitting at the right hand of God. Um, Jerry Falwell said Trump would be more effective as a president than Jesus would be. And so again, just making ties between religious people and political people. Um, and finally, we see religious imagery being used. And again, just a, a couple of pictures that I pulled off the web. Um, one talking about the prosperity gospel, which basically says God will give riches to those that he favors. Therefore, he clearly favors Trump because he has given him great riches. And another saying, um, clearly, Trump is doing the legislation that we need. And finally, tying country to religion, if you tie your country to one particular religion, you risk a problem. Um, still, I think there are seeds of hope in Bosnia and here. A uh, story that I'd like to finish with is that the last time I was in Bosnia, I went to visit two women who lived in a small village near Srebrenica. And these two women had reconstructed houses, but they had not gotten enough funds to reconstruct their kitchens fully. Between their houses, there was the burnt out shell of a third house with a stove that actually functioned in it. One woman was Muslim, the other woman was Serb. And the two of them simply had a good natured, you know, argument with each other as to, who had the nicest teacups to serve the visiting Americans. And it was clear that they were sharing the space in between. They were sharing each other's lives. And whenever I found groups of people working together in Bosnia, you found that as individuals, they very quickly overcame all of these divisions that you see in the rhetoric or in the kind of pictures I was showing. And I'm very sorry that gentleman left before we got to this part, uh, because I wanted to say this is not what you find in the hearts of individual people. John Paul II, when he visited Bosnia, said the same thing. And he said, quote, building a true and lasting peace is a great task entrusted to everyone. Certainly much depends on those who have public responsibility. But the future of peace depends no less decisively on a renewed solidarity of individual minds and hearts. And so although we look at the political situation in Bosnia and continue to see a country divided, a political situation that is not working well, among the individuals, you do not always see that, nor do you have to see that. And so in our own country, as we see a political situation that seems to be increasingly divided, I think, and I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, say something about what happened this weekend in Pittsburgh, um, we have a polarized country. But we also have many, many people who came together for a vigil there, just as Many, many people in Sarajevo came together for a march for peace and who, in their hearts, do not feel this division. Thank you.
Can you all hear me? Yeah? It's an honor for me to be here, and thank you for coming out today. I'd like to thank the J. Phillips Center and the Peace Studies Department here at uh, the College of St. Benedict, St. John's University. I would also like to thank my colleagues, Suha Naimi and uh, Paul Haidostian, for their support uh, while I prepared this paper. And I'd like to thank one of my students, and his name is Azadur Manjirian, who helped me conduct interviews and transcribe them and also interpret them. The title of my presentation is a quote from the Bible. The people of Aram shall go into exile. Practical and theological dilemmas of Middle Eastern churches since the beginning of the Syrian war. Um, maybe you feel a little bit cheated because I'm a Dutch person speaking about the Middle East, coming from the Middle East. Uh, but in my defense, I'd like to say that I've lived in the Middle East for over 10 years and that, I, that I'm married to a lovely Lebanese woman. So I have some expertise on the people of the region <laughs> and on life there. Many uh, prophetic books in the Bible deal with the reality of exile. In the Middle East, regional powers, that is in the ancient Middle East, regional powers such as the Assyrians and the Babylonians invaded smaller nations, such as Israel. And they deported vast numbers of people to other parts of their empires. The Hebrew prophets from the Bible witnessed this, and in their writings, they tried to come to terms with the reality of exile. How could they reconcile the reality of exile with their image of God as compassionate and faithful? The prophet Amos was one such prophet. He lived in a time of calm, just before the Assyrians rose to power, but it was a calm before the storm. And Amos warned that rampant injustice would inevitably lead to violence. About Syria, which was at that time called Aram, Amos prophesied the following. This is what the Lord says. I will break down the gate of Damascus. I will destroy the king. The people of Aram will go into exile. Now, it is not my intention to claim that this ancient prophecy has been fulfilled in recent years in Syria. Nor do I wish to imply that there is a link between the Syrian civil war and divine wrath. So let me make these disclaimers. The reason that I'm quoting this text is to help establish in our minds a relation between the struggles of the ancient Hebrew prophets with the reality of exile and the struggles of Syrian Christians today with a similar situation. Both struggles are related to the reality of exile. In this presentation, I will sketch some of the practical and theological dilemmas that the Middle Eastern churches have faced since the beginning of the Syrian war. And my description is primarily based on interviews with uh, a number of representative church leaders and on recent publications of Middle Eastern churches and their leaders. And hopefully the analysis of these dilemmas will shed light on the way the churches have contributed to peace in the Middle East or have maybe failed to do so. But first let me briefly introduce Syria to you and also briefly sketch uh, the Syrian war. And I think this is probably a refresher for uh, many of us because you would have followed the news over the past years. Syria is a relatively young state. It became independent in 1946 after the French mandate. Syria has borders with the following nation states. Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq, Jordan and Israel. Contrary to what many people may think uh, in the West, Syrian society is actually characterized by uh, an enormous diversity by ethnic and religious diversity. Although the majority of the population speaks Arabic, substantial minorities use other languages in Syria, such as the Assyrian language, the Aramaic language, the Armenian language, Turkish and Kurdish. On the eve of the civil war, Sunni Muslims formed the largest group in Syria, 70 to 74%. 
about 13%, or between 11 and 16, but I, I reckon it's about 13, were Muslims of other convictions, including Shiites and Alawites. 6 to 8% were Christian and 3% Druze. So that was uh, the demographics in 2011 on the eve of the civil war. For the past 50 years, Syria has been ruled by the Ba'ath Party. The leadership of Ba'ath has been predominantly drawn from the Alawi sect, which is one of Syria's ethno-religious minorities. And General Hafez al-Assad, whom you see on the left hand, who claimed the presidency in 1970, and his son Bashar al-Assad, who succeeded his father in the year 2000, are both Alawites. They have ruled Syria with the help of a group of loyal army commanders and politicians. And during their reign, they have built up an elaborate network of secret services, and this has instilled a culture of fear in the population of Syria. The Assad government has viewed Sunni radicalism as the major threat to stability in the country, which is why it has not allowed any dissension. So it's a, it has been very difficult over the past decades to express any alternative opinion in Syria. And this has to do with the perceived threat of Sunni radicalism in the country. However, this has led to the disenfranchisement of large segments of the population, especially the Sunni population. The Syrian war started as a popular uprising. And perhaps you remember this. It was part of the sequence uh, of uprisings in the so-called Arab Spring. Protesters took to the streets of the major cities in the spring of 2011 and they were demanding reforms, political reforms, in a more democratic direction and the release of political prisoners. The Syrian police and the army suppressed these demonstrations quite ruthlessly with increasing violence, arresting thousands and also killing many. So the revolution in the first few months already morphed very quickly into a civil war. Uh, the turning point came in July 2011 when large numbers of servicemen defected from the Syrian army and security forces and they formed their oppositional militia. Uh, the most known one is the Free Syrian Army. Maybe that term rings familiar to you. By now, the aim of the insurgents was the overthrow of President Assad and his government. And then came the involvement of jihadist groups, such as Jabhat al-Nusra and the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, also known as ISIS. These groups joined the war later on, so they were, they were not part of the mix from the very beginning. And uh, they used the instability in the country to push their own agenda, which is an Islamic State governed according to a strict interpretation of Sharia law. Another aspect of the war became the regional and international political interference. Uh, there's no time in this uh, presentation to go into that. It's well beyond the scope of what I want to say. Suffice it here to say that countries such as Russia, the United States of America, Iran, Turkey and Qatar, and I must also say my own country, Netherlands, have been involved indirectly by supporting uh, certain groups with weapons or with other resources, or directly with military intervention. So it, it was very complicated. The, the Syrian war is a very complicated war. The humanitarian cost of the Syrian war is staggering. We've just heard uh, numbers from Bosnia and from the Balkans. This, the death toll in the Syrian war may well have reached 500,000. And according to UNHCR estimates of July 2017, over 7.5 million Syrian people have been internally displaced at some point during the war, so within the country, and over 5 million have fled the country. So I understand that is about the population of Minnesota. So these are the figures. Now, let me talk a little bit about the Christians in Syria. Prior to 2011, the Christian population was estimated at 1.5 million, or 6 to 8 percent of the population. Syrian Christianity was very diverse and is still very diverse and included 
Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant Christians. Many Syrian churches, this is an interesting thing, uh, which we don't have in the United States or in Europe, many Syrian churches trace their lineage back right to the beginning of Christianity, so to the very first century. We know about Antioch in the Bible. So uh, the patriarchates of Syria are called Patriarchate of Antioch to indicate the uh, direct line with the apostles and with Jesus. So an uninterrupted presence in the land. And this has made the Syrian Christians very attached to their land. So their attachment to the land goes way back, uh, goes back from before the time of modern nation states, because these are very young. So they say we belong to this land as Christian community. And I think that's an interesting point for discussion later on, because there's a difference there with the Balkans, I think. So that's the Syrian Christians. Um, now, a hundred years ago, the attachment to the land of the Syrian Christians was deepened. And this uh, was due to the Armenian genocide and the SIFO. The SIFO is the technical term for the genocide on Assyrian and Syriac Christians, which happened at the same time as the Armenian genocide. When large uh, groups of people, Christians, were moved from south uh, eastern Turkey and pushed into north Syria, and of course, many uh, perished. So because, of, because they were removed from their ancestral lands right there, they got a deeper attachment to the lands that they could retain. So there's a deep connection to the land. That's 100 years ago, but the first decade of the 21st century did not bode well for the, for the Christians of the Middle East as well, especially in Iraq. Uh, while there were an estimated 700,000 Christians in Iraq before the year 2003, after the United States and the United Kingdom and their allies uh, removed Saddam Hussein and all the ensuing violence, uh, there are now an estimated 250,000. So the Iraqi Christian population has been, um, I mean, it's, it's maybe two thirds, uh, one third of what it was before all these, uh, all these events. Likewise, the Syrian war has profoundly as affected the Syrian Christian communities. The Syrian Christian uh, population has dwindled to about 4%. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come to this in a minute. Sorry about this. So I'll come to this in a minute. The Syrian uh, Christian population has dwindled to about uh, 4%. That means that about seven to 800,000 Christians have left the country. So that means that they've been halved probably half from what they were in 2011. Um, a quotation from a, a Syrian historian by the name of Syriani. At least 82 churches have been targeted by Islamist terrorists and destroyed either completely or partially. Six priests of different denominations were assassinated in cold blood. Two bishops of Aleppo were abducted by unknown armed insurgents. Two priests were kidnapped by Al-Nusra Front in October 2012. And the list continues. Uh, there's a very, this is, by the way, the Armenian uh, church in Derezor, and a very important church for the Armenian community because it was a place where the genocide was commemorated. So 100 years on from the Armenian genocide, this church was destroyed. So you can imagine the dramatic effect that this had on the Armenian Christian community of Syria. Uh, a very uh, dramatic story is also the story of the Christians of Raqqa. So Raqqa is a city in the east of uh, Syria, and there was a 5,000 strong Christian community there before the war. Uh, ISIS invaded, and ISIS gave the Christians a choice, either accept Sharia law and pay taxes, or convert to Islam, or you leave. So within 24 hours, uh, the, the whole population, almost everybody had to leave that city. And you can see uh, ISIS stripped the churches of their crosses and other religious symbols and uh, rose their flags there. So a very dramatic illustration of what happened in other places of the country as well. So the devastations of uh, the war have confronted Syrian Christians with some dilemmas, as I said, some practical and some theological dilemmas. So in preparation for uh, this conference, I thought, let me ask some of the church leaders. So I went and interviewed an Orthodox, a Catholic and a Protestant church leader. So uh, Monsignor George Azadurian, an Armenian Catholic, uh, George Saliba, who is a Syrian Orthodox bishop, 
and Reverend Joseph Kassab, who is uh, a Presbyterian General Secretary. So he's the General Secretary of the Presbyterian Church in Syria and Lebanon. And all three know Syria very well, and uh, you know, they, they spoke on behalf of the Syrian Christians. So let me, in the time that remains, uh, sketch some of these dilemmas that they're facing. The first dilemma is uh, related to the mass exodus of Christians. So many Christians have left, and uh, the church leaders corroborated this. So they said, yes, it's true that in our community, at least 50%, and maybe in some areas up to 70% of people have left. So why is this a problem to them? Well, on a very mundane level, you could say they're afraid to go out of business, right? So they're afraid that there will be no more churches in Syria. And uh, Bishop Arzadurian uh, actually expressed this. He said, it's very difficult to find people for the priesthood, and my people are leaving. But there is something deeper going on there. There is something deeper than just a fear for uh, their own denominations. The church leaders are concerned about more than just the perpetuation of their institutions. They believe that Syria, as a country, needs its minorities. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not that the church needs to stay there, it's that they believe that Syria as a country needs its minorities. This was very well expressed by uh, Bishop Saliba, who is from Kamishli, which is in the east, northeastern part of Syria, very close to Iraq. He said, I was born in Kamishli. We used to have Jews, Muslims, Kurds, and Christians there, and all lived together in harmony. In recent years, things have changed when the terrorists came. By the goodwill of good people, everything could be changed for the better. So in his words, you taste the nostalgia, and I think there's a lot of commonalities also here with the, the Balkans. Uh, there was a state of uh, peaceful coexistence, and it has changed. In light of this, the Syrian Christian leaders face a big dilemma. Why? Because they have a lot of families and individuals coming to them saying, I want to leave, I want to emigrate. So you have to imagine that church leaders in the Middle East um, their word counts a lot for uh, the people. Not like in my country where, where nobody listens to the clergy. <laughs> so in uh, the Middle East, people uh, value the word of a religious leader. And uh, when you want to emigrate as a Syrian Christian, you would also need a birth certificate, you would need a wedding certificate or maybe a baptism certificate. These are all given by the churches. So for these leaders, uh, it's very difficult to encourage their people to go. So what do you do as a religious leader? Do you urge people to stay or do you say, okay, it's right that you go? Bishop Saliba said, we do not wish for our people to leave to Europe, but we cannot stop them. This is their life. People try to do the best for their family and for their children. Very, very difficult, I think. I mean, you can feel the, the real dilemma there. The second dilemma is related to people in need. So, um, Throughout Syria, homes, factories, schools, and economic centers have been uh, damaged or destroyed. The Syrian cu currency uh, has devalued to, over, or to less than one-tenth of its original value. So you have to imagine that people suddenly are left with 10% uh, of their savings. So poverty has uh, sharply increased over the past years. So many church leaders have become involved in uh, relief work and in the alleviation of poverty. Reverend Joseph Kassab told me that no less than 1,500 families depend for their daily sustenance on the relief work of the Presbyterian Church. So that's a huge amount for a small church, because it's a small church. So what's the dilemma there? Well, do you give aid only to your own members, or only to Christians, or do you make it available for a wider group of people? Uh, the general line of the churches is to do the second. So they are in agreement, and uh, the Orthodox do it, and the, the Protestants as well, and I think the Catholics as well, mostly through the organization Caritas, that would be familiar, um, to make a, a aid available to Christians and Muslims. This is out of principle, but there's also a pragmatic reason behind it, which has to do with peacemaking, which is why I'm, I want to quote uh, this uh, word by Reverend Kassab. He said, our churches need to create a safety zone. We cannot be isolationist. We need to build peace with other religious groups. And sharing is a way of building peace. 
the other communities will remember this after the war, he said. That brings us to the relationship with the other faith communities, and there's also a dilemma there. What is the extent of the mission among vulnerable people? Many Syrians are so needy that uh, they will readily accept uh, food, hygiene products, help for education, and other forms of help from another religious community. So whoever, whoever wants to help me, let him help me. Uh, the question then becomes, what do the churches expect in return? What do the churches expect from the people they help in return? Reverend Kassab explained that although many Presbyterians have left Syria, church attendance has actually gone up in his church. Why? Well, he said, um, people who have received aid felt that while everybody betrayed them, this church stood by their side. So, they come and worship with us. Even uh, some Muslims came to our church and found comfort. When I pressed him a little bit on this, on this question, he said, well, there are no strings attached to our relief work. We do not ask people to come to church. And all three church leaders that I interviewed emphasized the importance of warm relations and no strings attached to the help. Bishop Saliba said, we do not call anybody an enemy. We call them our partners. Muslims in Syria are our partners in the country. There is one very, very delicate question there, and this was what uh, Bishop Azadurian told me, which is related to Christians carrying arms. I mean, Christian civilians carrying arms. Uh, Bishop Azadurian said, and uh, the question is then, should Syrian Christians carry arms to defend themselves? Bishop Azadurian said, um, our church members, the Armenian Catholics, have refused to carry arms from the beginning. However, when we felt insufficiently protected, we were forced to form small militias, local militias, to protect our communities. So both in Iraq and Syria, the Christian communities have defended themselves. But the, uh, they are very clear that this is not taking up arms against other faith communities or against Muslims, but it is to defend your, uh, your family or your village or your neighborhood against terrorists. So, but there's, there's of course, a very uh, tricky thing there. Relationships with the government, and here it gets maybe even more sensitive. By and large, the Syrian Christians have supported the Assad government. The majority of the Syrian Christians have taken the view that the removal of the Assad regime would be more costly than its preservation. This view is based on the conviction that the Assad regime will safeguard the interests of the minorities better than any other group will in the country. Maybe we can talk about this later as well, because I know that this is a sensitive point in the West, including in my country. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the Christians do not share a concern for reform in the country. So they do share some of the concerns that were alive in the, uh, the opposition, at the very beginning in particular. So there's an ambivalence there, and this ambivalence uh, leads to a dilemma. Can you express yourself in a critical way about your government? That's the dilemma. Or should you be silent? Now, here's what Bishop Saliba had to say about this. We are Christians. We worship God, we respect the king, the president, or whoever is responsible, and we love others. This is the teaching of our gospel in our church. Reverend Kassab had something else to say. He said, I admit the shortcomings of our uh, government as far as democratic structure is concerned. But he said, uh, there was a point during the war where all the Christians feared the rise of an Islamic State. I think that was in 2014 when ISIS was at its strongest and we realized that the alternative was not viable. At several stages in the war, uh, Syrian churches have released statements, uh, you know, official statements. And these have typically been uh, uncritical of the government. Uh, in 2011, at the very beginning of the war, the Jesuit community of Aleppo released a statement calling for uh, political reform. After that, several statements came out of the Orthodox and Protestant churches, but none was critical about the Syrian government. Uh, it was, they were very critical about uh, Western interference and about the opposition, but not about the government or about Russian interference. So this is interesting. In a recent essay, 
Danish scholar Andreas Bandak has analyzed the inability of Syrian Christians to respond a little bit more critical. Uh, and he, uh, he analyzed it in terms of fear. And he related his ideas to uh, Søren Kierkegaard's idea of angst or uh, anxiety. And Bandak compares the response of Syrian Christians to that of the Copts in Egypt. And he argues it's the deep-seated fear that translates into support for the regime and precludes more nuanced reactions. Um, this ties in with also an analysis of a sociologist by the name of Jonathan Fox, who states that whether religious institutions promote protest is highly dependent on whether the religion itself is threatened. So it's a deep sense of fear or uh, an existential threat. And I think that's what we have to understand when we think about the Syrian Christian communities. The before last dilemma, um, I don't know if I still have time, do I? Uh, before last. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm over time. Yeah. It's getting close. Okay, all right. So um, there's also a dilemma with rela in relation to the land. So the fear of extinction is closely related to the, fear, uh, to the land. In other words, Syrian Christians are afraid of a permanent exile from Syria. The, the, the dilemma is, of course, uh, for a church leader, do you think that your community is essentially linked to this land and cannot exist outside this land? Or do you see a future for your faith community outside the land? And uh, this is particularly pertinent for the Syrian Orthodox Church, which in its very name says we belong to Syria, not to the Republic, not to the Arab Republic of Syria, but to this part of the land. And in the view of the Christians of the Middle East, Syria is part of the cradle of Christianity. It's maybe not holy land, but it's where we come from. And again, I, wanna also, I want you to understand that for the Syrian churches, it's not about their own institutions, it's about something that concerns all of us. Uh, I think the fear of the Syrian Christians is that Christianity will get disconnected from its historic roots. So imagine that there's no Christian population left in Syria. That means that there will be a historic discontinuity between uh, our churches today, even here in Minnesota, and the cradle <coughs> Of Christianity. This is a special concern for the, for the Orthodox and the Catholics, I have to say. The Protestants are a little bit less concerned about this. Um, Reverend Kassab said, we want to be the church for Muslims. This may be the cradle of Christianity or the Holy Land, but he said, so what? Uh, if you are not the church for the present society, what kind of church are you? So Protestants have a, little, have a, have a different take on this. I'll quickly move to my final observation or final dilemma. And this is a dilemma, uh, where is God? So I started with uh, the prophet Amos, and I, I'd like to end there. So Amos and the other prophets related to the reality of exile. And I think they asked, where is God in this crisis? Can we continue claiming that God is faithful and compassionate uh, amidst all this violence? Or maybe with the words of Psalm 137, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? The answers of the church leaders were quite different and quite diverse uh, on this issue. Bishop Azadurian counseled submission to the will of God. He said we need to wait patiently for a new future. And he speaks about his Armenian experience there also. He said, I am Armenian. We have always been persecuted and killed by others, but we always resurrect. God is the one who gives life and who takes it away. We will always glorify God's will. So that was what he said. Reverend Kassab had a different answer, and he said, the young people in my church are asking these questions, and uh, they are asking me, is God at work in all this? And he answers very clearly. He said, there's no wisdom of God here. Only Satan is at work here. God is at work fighting this evil somewhere else. Traditional theologies ascribe this to God, but we need other answers. So you, f you feel the difference between these two. A real dilemma. The people of Aram shall go into exile, prophesied Amos in the 8th century BC. Today, uh, the pervasive reality of exile is confronting the churches of the Middle East with both practical and theological dilemmas. The church leaders view the continuing presence of Syrian Christians in the land as essential for a just and peaceful coexistence in that country and an essential contribution to world Christianity. That is why the threat of a permanent exile causes such anxiety among their leaders. We are actually also thankful for signs of hope. 
there are signs of hope for the Christian community because churches are being reconstructed, weddings are being celebrated again, and even the painters are back to work in the churches, painting icons or religious art. The Christian community, now smaller than before the war, will have an important role to play in the process of reconstruction. Thank you. Okay, if you could slide whatever questions you might have on your cards down to the end and somehow someone get them up to me, that would be fantastic. There are the two mics on uh, each end there. And um, while those are coming forward, or am I seeing any movement to mics? All right, here we go. Good. Thank you very much. Is this working? Can you guys hear me? We can hear. I don't know if they can hear the tape. Is there an on button on that? I uh, don't work with on buttons. Let's see. Better? Better? Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, thank you to both of our presenters. My question is to the second presenter. And um, so you are, you're drawing the analogy with, uh, with, with the, what would be referred to as the Babylonian captivity with the Jews. The, the figure that they looked at as their savior figure for that, he's even referred to as the anointed in, in one text, at least that I know of, is Cyrus, this yeah. external power yeah. who sort of accomplishes this homecoming for them. I'm curious about, and this is of course, you have an external power that's coming in, originally removing the Jews from that territory, and then a portion of the Jews, and then an external power, another external power, restoring those who are interested in going back. Um, in this case, for these communities that you're looking at, who do, do they have, and I, and I, and, and I know censorship is an, an issue here, do they have a Cyrus? Who would be the Cyrus figure for them? I think you have the answer in your mind. <laughs> well, I mean, what's interesting, I, I was struck initially by them mentioning, uh, I would, I mean, the person that they're looking at right now, or you had mentioned, is some of them see Assad as being the most viable option right now. Yeah. Is that? Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't think the Syrian Christians view President Assad as a Cyrus. Yeah. I do think the, the Syrian Christians and many Lebanese Christians with them um, believe that President Assad should be a part of the future of Syria and that uh, President Putin of Russia has also played a very helpful role for their communities. Mm -hmm. So whereas uh, in Europe, President Putin and Russia's interference has been perceived as very destructive, mm -hmm. for the Christian communities uh, it has brought safety. But I have not seen any religious interpretation of that. So I think, uh, yeah, you know, like Cyrus was, was the anointed of God in the Old Testament, uh, President Assad and, and Vladimir Putin are, are not viewed as anointed by God. Yeah. Yeah, it's a complex yeah. situation. It's a complex situation, but yeah, but yeah. thank you for the question, yeah. In the Syrian war, I have heard that climate change has played a role there, that uh, several years of drought uh, and rainfall uh, changes related to a warming climate uh, caused uh, people from the countryside to move into the urban areas and that that may have exacerbated uh, existing hostilities uh, to find the presence of what were perceived to be non elohite or non uh, inappropriate in the view of one group movement of people into an area occupied by another group. C can you speak to that uh, yeah. possibility? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, I don't think we should overstate the influence of climate change, but if you um, know a little bit about the, uh, the area of eastern Syria and northwestern Iraq, this was an area hit by drought recently. So even some of our students who are from that area say, well, when I was a child there was a river there and now it's, it's just a dry riverbed. Uh, and that was the area where ISIS and other radical groups uh, found most um, resonance among the people. Though I think the people of that area have by now also become disillusioned with uh, the terrorist groups. But that's the area of Mosul, uh, Raqqa, Deir Zor. Yeah. So definitely climate change plays a role there. And the move to the city, uh, as you say, yeah, so I think these, but I, 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 don't think, I don't think we can overstate it. It's one of the factors, not the main factor. But it's, it's certainly a pointer in the direction of peace. So I think um, 
How do we build peace? Well, also by uh, supporting good initiatives for nature, for farming, for sustainability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody else gets the courage to come to the mic. I'm going to do the courageous act of quoting Mr. Rogers uh, <laughs> today. If anyone listened to public radio uh, mm -hmm. today, they may have heard one A. a I'm actually going to quote Mrs. Uh, Mr. Rogers' mother. Mm -hmm. um, who said, whenever there's a catastrophe, and this certainly seems to qualify, and he was speaking most into to media coverage of last weekend and just how we cover uh, events, but uh, Mrs. Rogers told, uh, well, his mom, um, told Fred Rogers to whenever there's a catastrophe to look to the helpers, look mm -hmm. for the helpers in terms of how you cover events. Mm -hmm. So thinking of both of what you two have covered, could you tell us any helper stories that might answer that last dilemma number eight of yours of yeah. that question of where is God or something related to the, the helpers that you experienced in these two mm -hmm. catastrophes that you've covered? I think there were some marvelous helpers in Bosnia, two that come to mind um, to me immediately. Um, one is uh, one of the, uh, it was the daughter or granddaughter, I believe it was the granddaughter of Tito. Um, she traveled all around Serbia, Bosnia, Croatia, and she collected stories of the people who helped each other across ethnic and religious lines uh, during the war and uh, no, matter, you know, no matter what. Um, and the interesting thing, the really sad thing, was she had all of these stories assembled together on her computer and somebody stole her computer. And she had to do it all over again. She had, she had assembled, um, you know, uh, about a hundred of these stories. She did not want to go back to the same people and ask them to tell their story again. So she went out and she found a hundred new people and got a hundred more stories of people who had helped. So, you know, she was someone who documented the individual helpers. But um, since the war, there have also been a, a lot of NGOs that have worked to build peace in Bosnia. And one of them was funded by uh, St. John's very own trustee, Dan Whalen, who um, founded an NGO in which he would get young people from all the different ethnic groups to work together on projects, uh, building co-ops, agricultural projects, um, medical and educational projects. And then he also offered these young people, after they had completed one of these projects, an education, either there in Bosnia or here in the United States, which led us to having about 50 wonderful young Bosnian students from all ethnic groups um, as our students here at St. Ben's and St. John's. Um, so we do find, I think, that one of the best ways to overcome um, partisan differences is to work together on some sort of project. And that in the working together, people see the humanity that is shared on all sides. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would underline that. I think in Syria, you have the, the helpers inside the country. So I think these are the people who stayed there, uh, were faithful to the country, kept believing in the country. So in a discourse where everybody says, I want to leave, and this is hopeless, people, there are people who say, I want to stay, and I believe this country is worth living in. And these are also the churches. So I think the churches have been great helpers in the Syrian war, because they kept their schools going and their relief work. Uh, but um, now in a situation of reconstruction, joint projects are, are very good. So let me give one example of um, a, a very small scale project over the past years. There was a, a soap maker and his uh, business was uh, destroyed because of the war. So his instruments were destroyed. So he didn't have the capital to restart his business. So um, a Western church in Germany said, I, we want to help you. So he, he, he could make some hand, uh, makeshift handmade soap that was sold in Germany then, which you know, helped him to gain capital to restart his business. Mm -hmm. so, it's, yeah, so that's, that's a church project. So that's not an interfaith project. Mm -hmm. But you could also imagine uh, these things happening on an interfaith basis. And I think there's inc uh, an increasing number of people thinking about this. How can we help people in a certain region 
start to work and uh, develop economic activity together. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things that I think was interesting with our two talks is that, you know, both took place in a Civil War context, yeah. um, in, in each of them involving Christians and Muslims. And, um, I, you know, I think we can see that you can't say that either religion is the aggressor, you know, or that either religion um, motivates its people more to violence. You find that it, uh, so much just depends on the political situation, the economic situation, um, and unfortunately, I think, on the kinds of leadership that, uh, that people have. Yeah, I have a helper story from Bosnia. It came from a man in my church who was an army officer, a West Point graduate, um, and an engineer. And he was working in a peacekeeping mission in Bosnia. And I think that's an example of intervention that actually might do some good. Um, and he said it was the best experience he ever had in his life, including his experience in the army. He went to a town in, somewhere in Bosnia, and he was scheduled to meet two men at a town hall because they were going to work together to reconstruct a road. And this is where his engineering would, would come in handy, and he was going to meet two young engineers, and one was a Muslim and one was a Catholic, I believe. And what transpired was that these two men had grown up together. They'd known each other from the time they were children. They had been friends, but they hadn't seen each other for all the years of the war. And so they had a reunion, a cheerful reunion in this town hall, and then they set about with the project of rebuilding the road. But he said it was just such a powerful um, experience and um, for him. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. There was a group, or there was a question from the last group that didn't get, um, uh, post because we ran out of time, uh, but I think it's, it uh, pertains to this one very well. Is there something to the idea that psychologically we like to be around like-minded people? It kind of, I, I thought it was appropriate because mm -hmm. both of these societies you described, they sound so cosmopolitan and mm -hmm. wonderful and at times we seem to embrace that, but is there mm -hmm. something, a switch that can happen where then like-mindedness either in political view or in you know religious background or whatever takes over? One comment I would make on that, and here I'll take off, you know, my uh, theologian hat, put on my computer science hat, is that I do think um, that in our own country, we are not being well served by social media. That um, social media, uh, it's, it's clear, you know, sociologists have documented the fact that social media is tending to push us into more like-minded bubbles. Um, I think, you know, we can't necessarily blame social media for what happened in the Balkans or what happened in Syria. Um, there, I think, what often happens is simply fear. You know, that, that fear um, brings up um, if we become or find, think we have reason to fear the other, then it, it becomes um, easy for us to draw a harder line between us. I, I think uh, in Syria and also in Lebanon, um, generally people uh, take pride in their diversity, in the diversity of their societies. Uh -huh. So, for example, Aleppo, uh, I think Reverend Paul would, uh, would affirm this, Aleppo was always a very diverse city, and the people of Aleppo would always say, we love to live together as Christians and Muslims, and whoever else is there. So, but when a spark from outside uh, comes and uh, sparks fear, as you're saying, mm -hmm. this changes. And so then, th th there are also so, so many stories, I think, uh, from the Balkan War, and also from the Syrian War, where people said, we were such good neighbors. Mm -hmm. Then in the war something happened and yeah. they turned on me. Mm -hmm. So the question then is what happens uh, so that our perception of the other changes and so that we, that we no longer trust? So I think may maybe it's not deep inside us that we want to be with like-minded people. Maybe mm -hmm. actually what is deep inside us is that we want to be with people who are different from us. 
I hope I, I like to think that. Mm -hmm. And there's there's another factor that brings in this this fear right, whereby we suddenly uh, perceive what is different as a threat. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's a really a, a, a big task for us to put our finger on that mm -hmm. because that is also a way to peace once you have once you get that clear, right? Well, how, how does the image of the other change in your mind and how can you prevent that from happening? Yeah. Thank you, that's actually very similar to my question. So my question is regarding Syria and I find it really beautiful how religions coexisted prior to the war um, and I'm just wondering how you think that will be changed post-conflict whenever that does come because how I understand it, uh, Assad will win and um, most likely, like I have Syrian friends that are Muslim and that to them is so heartbreaking because it seems like all everything is for nothing, like the uprising was for nothing and things like that, but for, if I'm correct about it, for Christians, they're more okay with that fact. And I wonder how these kind of grievances, perhaps post-conflict of Syria, will influence the interfaith coexistence? And will they hold grudges? Will Muslims hold grudges against Christians? Or how will these different um, ideas of Assad really impact interfaith? Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a really good question. You know, I, th I think regardless of who wins, uh, to a certain extent, the situation of before the war will be picked up again. So many friendships have not died in the war also. So many people have remained friends, so they will continue to be friends, which is beautiful because that means you can continue. Uh, but in, on the question of grudges, that's a difficult one. Mm -hmm. So the, the Lebanese civil war um, is still very much on the minds of people, but people don't speak about it in Lebanon. And what you didn't have in Lebanon after the war is a kind of national reconciliation. So. I've been thinking a lot about this. Why didn't this happen? But maybe that's simply not the culture. Maybe it's not the culture to go to your neighbors and open all these wounds and speak about it mm -hmm. again. Maybe it should be uh, in the silence so that you can continue. I think in Syria something similar will happen. I don't think that it's, it's going to be out in the open who did what. Of course, some people will know and they will hold these grudges, but it, I think it will be in the silence. But the Syrian, the Syrian situation will, I think, be very similar to the Iraqi situation where there's no equilibrium yet and where uh, violence uh, continues. And, uh, you know, underground also, there's still a lot of hatred and violence. So we are afraid that Syria will not come to a full peace. Yeah. If I may, just following up on that, is there any, have you noticed any emerging, like, narrative in explaining these events that seems common to the different groups you work with? Like one of the figures, I was trying to pay attention to that, and one of the, the figures you, you, you had pinpointed talked about the terrorists coming in. Mm. And I was like, for that particular group, is it the idea that this is an external threat that's yep. coming in? Yeah. There's sort of an invasion. Is, is there this idea of sort of thinking of this as being something that's coming from the outside and not yep. something from the inside? Yes, yes, absolutely. I think uh, the vast majority of Syrian people, Muslims and Christians alike, um, think that the war was caused by external circumstances or by external factors, by uh, regional and international powers meddling. Uh, so their perception is also that the terrorist groups are instruments in the hands of the regional and international powers, which is not so strange if you, re I mean, if you know how much funding came to uh, ISIS and al-Nusra Front from certain countries in the region, Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, uh, and other countries. So yes, the, the threat is perceived to be from without and not from within. And of course, you, don't, you cannot say it's a Muslim who came to uh, raid my village. Mm -hmm. It was a terrorist. Because the, the mistake of that person was not that he was a Muslim, but that he was a terrorist. Or the, the vice of that person. So that's why the, the Christians uh, certainly uh, do not label the perpetrators as Muslims. Because their, their neighbors and their friends are also Muslims. Is that, does that answer you? Yeah, no, yeah. it's just it's interesting yeah. for me thinking about going forward. I don't, I don't know whether or not that is necessarily true in every instance, but at least it would, insofar as that's true, or insofar mm -hmm. as people are talking about that together, it would seem to at least allow space for people within their own country yeah. to say that we're not the problem. Yeah. You know, it's not you or me, but it seems to come from the outside, which would seem to at least set a stage that could be productive mm -hmm. for future conversations. Yeah. That's hard for me. Yeah. As I think also one of the commonalities between the Balkans and uh, the Middle East is that what we need to do for peace is strengthen the minorities. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So what you see even today happening in the Balkans is that some, uh, there's, there's, an, there's an issue also, I think, on the border of Serbia, isn't there? Yes. With a small community that uh, they want to filter out. So in the Middle East, you have the same problem. Uh, the more homogenous a country becomes, uh, actually, the less peaceful a country becomes. So mm -hmm. if we want to work for peace, we need to strengthen the minorities. I, re I really strongly believe so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Noreen, I'm wondering if you could comment on, since we are post-conflict there, what are the narratives that you hear explaining what happened in the Balkans? And then when you were mentioning Lebanon before, if the narratives that kind of play out in terms of external, internal, all that. Yeah. The narratives differ in the Balkans. You still hear uh, very nationalistic narratives from some groups. Um, with other groups, uh, less so. So you find that um, you still, you know, for example, I, I was very disturbed to, um, to read what uh, the Serbian um, <coughs> newly elected president said, that, well, we couldn't live with these people in the big Yugoslavia, and now they're still trying to force us to live together. I hear in that uh, echoes that are still suggesting that um, that rather than your vision of people living in a mixed community, there's still the desire for a, um, well, I don't want to use racially because there's actually no racial difference between these groups, but uh, religious or ethnic um, purity. Um, but certainly I find among others, uh, in Sarajevo I found a great deal of sadness and nostalgia for this cosmopolitan intermixing that you described as also having been the case in Aleppo. Um, and people being, you know, very sad about the fact that they now do not have the the strong minorities that they used to have in the capital city. Yeah, in the Lebanese context, um, Lebanon is subdivided in, uh, into uh, territories where uh, people of certain religions live. Uh, and the people who, uh, let's say the Christians who live in a predominantly Christian area would uh, typically perceive Muslims as a threat whereas the people who live in mixed areas in the capital Beirut uh, do not perceive Muslims as a threat. So our university, Haigazian University, is very intentional about being in the area where we are. So there was an option once in the history of Haigazian to, to be in the Christian area. That was after the war. So this is, uh, this, this is history of Haigazian. It's, it's nice to tell that maybe. During the war, we had to move from our very diverse area to a Christian area for security reasons. Then after the war, that was well before I ever arrived to Haigazian, but <laughs> I know this. An intentional choice was made to come back to the area where we are, which is a mixed area. And uh, on campus, we are also very intentional about uh, mixing people. Why? Because you make friendships, and uh, then the other is no longer a threat. So that, I think we have both narratives in the country. So Muslims who live in an exclusively Muslim area are bound to make images of Christians that are not based on their friendships or their relationships mm -hmm. or on the reality of who a Christian is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say um, mixing is good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think we've hit the end of our time. If you'd like to stay and mix for a few minutes, <laughs> yeah. I encourage you to do so. Thank mm -hmm. you all very, very much for coming. Thank you. And thank you for the two panels. Thank you.